Chapter 16, Through a Glass Floor. The first one to guess where the trip was to be was Pete. I think the mystery part in it is that we're going to Wizard Circus, he said. Right, Mr. Hollister nodded. Pam's eyes suddenly lighted up. I have a guess about the part to help your business, Dad. We're going to look at another houseboat. Her father laughed. I can see the Hollister Super Sleuth Club is working again, he said. One guess from each of you, and you're right the first time. Mrs. Hollister smiled and said no one had to guess about the fun they would have. Any time the Happy Hollisters were together, they had fun. You're right, Elaine, her husband agreed. But there is a special treat we'll have on the way. Suppose we keep it a secret. The children tried to make him tell, but he only laughed. He suggested that everyone get ready to leave as promptly as possible. Then he added, pack swimsuits and pajamas. We might stay overnight. By nine o'clock, everyone was ready to leave. Mr. Hollister had rented a station wagon in town, just like theirs at home. Mr. Hollister and the family took their usual places. Mrs. Hollister and Sue in front, the girls in the middle seat, and the boys in the rear. Mr. Hollister drove for two hours through open, sandy country, sprinkled with groves of grapefruit and lemon trees. How sweet it smelled, they thought. Presently, they came to a canal, and Mr. Hollister took the road that ran alongside it, past pink, blue, yellow, and green cottages. He stopped in front of a houseboat, and everyone got out. A stiff breeze was blowing, but it was warm. The houseboat was not so attractive as those at Circus Island, and Mr. Hollister decided at once it would not be suitable for his client. I'm not even going inside, he said. We'll push on as soon as you've all had a chance to stretch your legs a bit. The children played tag for 10 minutes, then got back into the car. Mrs. Hollister, sighing, took a comb from her purse and began to comb Sue's hair. The trade winds are wonderful, she said. It would be dreadfully hot without them, but they're disastrous for hair. Gazing at Pete's blonde head, she laughed. Not a hair out of place in a crew cut. Perhaps we should all have crew cuts, girls. Oh no, Mr. Hollister exclaimed in horror. I like our hair the way it is, Sue announced. I don't want anyone to cut off my curls. All right, Sue, Pam said. Mother may have a crew cut. The boy and their father laughed loudly at the thought of the pretty mother going about with a crew cut. At 12 o'clock, Mr. Hollister drew up beside a white concrete building set in a palm grove. Among the trees on one side of the building were bright colored tables and chairs. Beyond was a lagoon with many small boats in it. We'll stop here for a little sightseeing, Mr. Hollister announced, and then have lunch. He led the family into the building and down a long flight of steps to a circular room where great glass enclosed tanks lined the walls. Swimming about in them were tropical fish of various kinds. Crickets, Pete said, staring at a small mass of misty, waving tentacles. What's that? The sign by the tank says it's a sea anemone, Pam told him. A few feet away, Sue and Holly were laughing. See these cowfish with horns, Holly called, pointing to a pair of goggle-eyed fish whose faces looked like those of tiny cows. Beside them, a spotted, thick-shelled fish gazed out with great, popping brown eyes. Ricky read the sign. That's a trunk fish, he told his sisters, but it looks more like hippopotamus. More fearsome than most of the others was an unfriendly giant ray. It moved through the water with great bat-like wings as though it were flying. The fish bumped its flat nose against the glass in an effort to strike at the children. After the Hollisters had looked at all the fascinating sea creatures, they went upstairs to the outdoor dining room to have lunch. Boy, Ricky said, gazing at the green water of the lagoon. 
Now's the time to go swimming. I'm hot. His father shook his head, saying, Not now, Ricky. We must eat. Then after lunch, we're going out in a glass bottom boat. What's that, Daddy? Sue asked. He explained that these rowboats had heavy glass floors, so one could look down through the water and see the plant and animal life. When lunch was finished, he found an old skipper waiting at the end of the dock with a three-seated rowboat. Everyone piled in. Ricky was the last one aboard and made it with a flying leap. He sat down in the stern beside Pete, wishing he was in the water with the fish. It would be much cooler there. As the little boat started off, strange, colorful fish could be seen swimming beneath the craft. Mr. Murdoch, the skipper, explained the various underwater marvels. But Ricky was not paying attention. Slowly, he was taking off his shirt and shoes. A moment later, Pete, who had his head very close to the glass bottom, jumped back. A large object had swum directly under the boat. Pam began to laugh. On a hunch, she'd turned around. Ricky was gone. It's Ricky, she said. So it is, Mr. Hollister said, thinking how his mischievous son had arranged for a swim anyway. I guess Ricky's the biggest fish in the lagoon, Holly giggled. Not quite the biggest, the skipper said. I'll bet Old Faithful would outweigh him. Who's Old Faithful? Pam asked. And they all turned to look at the ruddy-faced man. That's what we call the giant green turtle who lives in the lagoon, Mr. Murdoch explained. He's a Florida glider turtle, and he's been making this his home since before anyone in these parts can remember. Where'd Ricky go? Holly asked, worried. She could not see him anywhere. Suddenly, a spray of water shot into the boat. Everyone turned to glimpse Ricky's dancing eyes, a stream of water spurting from between his front teeth. Ricky, said Mrs. Hollister, I want you to... The boy did not hear her, for he had made a neat surface dive and disappeared. Your boy's a real tadpole, the skipper remarked. That's what Mommy calls him, Sue giggled. Presently, Mrs. Hollister became concerned. Why didn't her son come up for air? He had been down for what seemed a very long time. Oh, I see Ricky, Holly suddenly cried out, pointing through the glass floor. At the bottom of the lagoon was Ricky, upside down, legs kicking wildly. He seemed very busy at some special task. What on earth is the boy doing? Mrs. Hollister exclaimed. Maybe he found a pirate treasure, Holly suggested. Or an oyster with a pearl in it, Pete added, winking at his father. All at once, there was a great splashing of water and the boy began to rise. Ricky, his impish face red from lack of air, popped his head above the surface and called out, panting, help me someone, he's awful heavy, but what a prize. Ricky was treading water as fast as he could, but the odd looking object struggling in his arms kept pulling him under. Mr. Murdoch laughed loudly, but it was several seconds before the Hollisters could learn the reason for his mirth. He's wrestling with Old Faithful, the skipper said. Leaning over the side, he quickly explained to the boy that the giant turtle must be put back. Old Faithful was a lagoon landmark and pet. Ricky released his huge prize. Then sorrowfully, he scrambled back into the boat. Shucks, he said. Old Faithful would have been swell to have in Shoreham. His father laughed. He'd have made a lot of turtle soup. As for me, I could do without it. I'd prefer that the turtle stay on the bottom of the lagoon. Me too, said Sue, who had never tasted turtle soup, but she decided if her daddy did not like it, she would not either. She made everyone laugh by adding, the turtle's so hard, I guess he doesn't have much juice in him anyway. After gazing down at the fish and plants in the lagoon a while longer, Mrs. Hollister suggested that perhaps it was time to go on. You HSSCs still have the mystery part of this trip to solve, she reminded the children. That's right, said Pete. 
Are we going to the wizard circus now? Yes, Pete. How far is it, Dad? Only another 10 miles. Pete asked the skipper if he had ever heard of it. Oh yes, Mr. Murdoch replied. Folks from Wizard eat here once in a while. I take them out to watch the fish sometimes. I guess it's a change from watching the circus animals all the time. Do you know anything about the man who owns it? Mr. Hollister questioned. Not much, except what the folks tell me. I hear a lot of them left other circuses to go with Wizard, and now they regret it. Why? Well, I'm not sure. They're well paid, but they just don't like the way the owner runs things. I guess he's hard to get along with, and... As the skipper paused, Pete said, Yes, please go on. Mr. Murdoch was thoughtful a few moments as he pulled slowly on the oars. Finally, he said, I'm not one to gossip, but you look like nice folks, so I suppose it won't hurt to tell you what some of the bareback riders said one day. They don't think the circus being run honest. The Hollisters gasped. Such a place could be using stolen trick dogs. By this time, the boat had reached the dock and the visitors scrambled out. They thanked the skipper for the ride and his information about Wizard Circus and said goodbye. As they started up the path to the parking space, Pete cried out, Crickets, look, isn't that Toto coming out of the restaurant? He pointed to a big man hurrying toward a nearby car. Before the other Hollisters could catch a glimpse of the man's face, he had ducked into the automobile. It started quickly and sped down the road. I'll bet he's heading for Wizard Circus, Pete said. Do you suppose he's left Peppo's Circus for good? Pam exclaimed. I hope he has, Sue said, and all his naughty elephants, too. Let's follow him, Dad, Pete urged, and dashed ahead to open the car door for his mother. Mr. Hollister was willing, and everyone scrambled into the station wagon. They kept the elephant trainer's car in sight for a couple of miles. Then, in a little town, it disappeared in traffic. Realizing the children's disappointment, Mrs. Hollister said, We aren't sure that man is Toto. But if he is and he's headed for Wizard Circus, we'll see him when we get there. Oh, that's right, of course we will, Pam said. It was four o'clock when they came to the village where Wizard Circus was located. Mr. Hollister asked a policeman in the center of town to direct him to the circus grounds. Following his instructions, they drove straight ahead and about a mile out of the village turned onto a gravelly road. It was hot and treeless. There were no houses, just hummocks of grass in the sandy fields. Presently, Ricky let out a whoop. There it is, I see it, he exclaimed. The boy pointed to a group of brown and yellow canvas tops just visible over the high board fence. As they drew closer, Pam said, listen. Boy, are they off key, Pete remarked. They sound like a bunch of real amateurs compared to Peppo's band. They sure do, ouch, said Ricky, clapping his hands over his ears as a trumpeter hit a wrong note. There was no parking lot in sight, a fact which Mrs. Hollister remarked seemed strange. Her husband pulled the car off to the side of the road and stopped. They all got out. Around the circus grounds, set some distance back in a field, was a high board fence, roughly built, as if it had been constructed in great haste. Isn't there any entrance to this place? Ricky asked, as they walked for some time along the fence. Holly had pranced ahead and was the first to spy one. Here's the gate, she called. Right up here, there's a big sign on it. The others quickened their steps. Reaching the entrance, they found it closed and locked. On it, in bright red paint, had been printed the words, absolutely no visitors allowed at any time. 